Hello, and welcome to another episode of Philosophy for Flourishing. I'm joined today by my colleague, John Hersey, and our special guest, Dr. Raymond Niles. Uh, Dr. Niles is going to be teaching a course uh, beginning this January, a 12-hour course, uh, titled Henry Hazlitt Meets Ayn Rand, Economics and Objectivism United for Freedom. And uh, we're really excited to, to speak with Ray today because this is a unique course. Um, and, uh, and we're hoping that our audience will uh, be enticed by this discussion to sign up. Uh, so uh, welcome, Ray. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Craig and John. Thanks so for coming on. I want to start just with, a, I actually sent out an email today uh, announcing your course. And in that email, I reflected on a letter that Ayn Rand had written to Leonard Reed back in 1946 when he was just uh, sort of launching or getting ready to launch the Foundation for Economic Education. And this is from her book, Letters of Ayn Rand. Uh, and it's a remarkable letter because she says to him, you know, she's, they were very friendly with each other and she uh, admired him and his, and his work, but she was critical of the way that he was starting Fee because she, she pointed out at one point, she says, people are not embracing collectivism because they have accepted bad economics. They're accepting bad economics because they've embraced collectivism, right? And then she goes on to really sort of flesh this out and talk about what people really need. You know, a, a lot of economists over many decades have pointed out the basics of the way that a free market works and why it's good for everyone who is willing to engage and be productive and trade. Um, but this all falls on deaf ears if people have philosophic and moral ideas that run contrary to this, right? And, and then and this was her point. And the thing I love about this course you're gonna teach here is that I think that this may be the first time I've ever seen a course taught on economics explicitly integrating the basic principles of this very important science with the principles of objectivism, the principles that Ayn Rand identified that really do undergird and support free markets like nothing else does. So tell us a little bit about, about your course and, uh, and what, what's in store there. Thanks, Craig. Yes. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to explain in the course, it's an introduction uh, to economics, but from an objectivist perspective. And I've never taken a course like this. Uh, um, so what we're going to do is um, build a view of economics uh, based on certain principles that right now do not, are not really part of economics. I, I'd say the big one that comes from objectivism is the idea of individualism the idea that we have a right to our own individual lives and really the right that's embodied in our declaration of independence the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness now it's interesting that the founding fathers uh actually wrote in the original draft of the declaration of independence that you had a right to your property because they knew that the only way you can actually pursue your happiness your dreams, your fulfillment, was if you could keep the fruits of your labor. You can, in other words, say you could pursue your career, you could have a house, you could have food, you could have all the good things that make life worthwhile. So the, the justification of, um, of capitalism is that individuals can flourish and that all individuals can flourish together. So what, what economics will show or what it shows is that um, it's possible for individuals to flourish together in a society it, it, by trading with each other. So it shows that an individualist uh, philosophy is practical. That's, that's what economics does. But when I think about you know, the way economics is approached, and, and really the error goes actually all the way back to uh, the first economist, uh, the classical economist, really following in the tradition of Adam Smith, they tended to justify um, capitalism by saying that it results, for example, in the greatest good for the greatest number. That's utilitarianism. Or that it, for example, helps the poor people, right? That's altruism. And if that's the basis for um, 
thinking about capitalism, that's really a faulty moral framework. So that's something I would address in the, I plan on addressing in the course. What do you think, what do you think are some of the most pressing reasons um, for this being a, a really relevant course for people right now? Well, I think it's relevant right now because we live in an age where uh, we're losing our economic freedom, right? Every day. I mean, there are more and more regulations, more and more controls, uh, you know, things like, you know, rent controls are spreading, um, uh, taxes are increasing, business regulations are expanding. Um, we have the whole onslaught of antitrust against our most successful companies. So Facebook, Google, Amazon are right now being basically persecuted by the antitrust laws. And I think it's important to understand uh, both, you know, from a moral sense and an economic sense uh, that, you know, that these companies, for example, have a right to exist. And in fact, that we benefit when Jeff Bezos makes, you know, fortunes in the billions of dollars. So, after you've taken this course, you will gain a detailed, richer understanding of how the economy operates under a sound uh, moral framework, and that will actually let you rebut, rebut the critics of capitalism. So if you're interested in, for example, in writing um, and, and you know, sort of standing up for freedom, you will be armed with better tools to do that. And it doesn't, you may not be doing it necessarily in writing, but even just in your conversations with people and in your own understanding, when you read stuff in the newspapers, you will understand the errors in those ideas. So um, given that this is a, an intro of sorts to economics, although of course wedded with philosophic ideas, um, and you're, 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 you're referencing Henry Hazlitt, uh, the, the, the wonderful author of Economics in One Lesson. I'm sure that you're going, to be, you, you're going to be pulling material from that book. So you'll be talking about things like the broken window fallacy and, and various other fallacies and principles of, of economics. Can you give an indication of, of a few of those that you'll be discussing and, ha and how you might be relating those to philosophic issues? Yeah, well, Henry Hazlitt, uh, we're going to use it, you know, kind of a, a, basically as a textbook in class, but it's really short and fairly, you know, a pretty easy reading. He, he was a columnist for many years, for decades at Newsweek, and he's a clear, you know, clear writer. Uh, but his, his famous book is called Economics in One Lesson. And actually, the first chapter of that book will be assigned before you start class. It shouldn't take you that long to read. In fact, I can't even tell you what the lesson is right now, okay? In fact, I, uh, you know, this is a quote uh, from that first chapter. Henry Hazlitt says, the art of economics consists of looking not merely at the immediate effect, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of, of, of the policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. This is how economists think. So more than anything you should get from this course is you should learn how to think like an economist. An economist thinks what, not just what is the effect of a policy, say for example, a tariff on imports or a rent control or an income tax or a welfare program. An economist doesn't just think about the effect on that one particular group, but an economist thinks about the, the un, sort of unseen effects or the harder to see effects on everyone. And an economist also doesn't just think about the immediate effect right now. Uh, for example, if you're a tenant in New York City and the government doesn't allow rents to rise, you might say, hooray. But what that does is that chokes off the supply of housing for all future tenants who want to move to New York City, right? That's what an economist thinks about. So that's sort of, Hazlitt provides the mental framework, I would say, for understanding our current economy and the issues that we face where we have a mixed economy where the government has a heavy hand in violating uh, economic freedom. But he's not the only economist we're going to use, okay? Uh, the other economist, um, if I wanted to, you know, have uh, uh, you know, a, a second title for the course, it'd be Adam Smith meets Ayn Rand. Um, Adam Smith is the father of economics. So we're going to be looking at some of the basic principles of Adam Smith to understand how and why an economy is efficacious and productive. For example, his concept of the division of labor. Adam Smith identified why a capitalist economy is productive. 
through the division of labor. So, and you know, it, it, we're going to expand on that idea. And one of the reasons for bringing Adam Smith into the equation is that Adam Smith actually identified the role of self-interest in creating wealth. And this would be a principle that objectivism defends. Now, he doesn't, he did, unfortunately, didn't defend the principle of, of self-interest the way Ayn Rand did. But, uh, uh, you know, Adam Smith, there's a famous quote, uh, uh, the most famous quote from Adam Smith, um, where he says, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Indeed, that is true. So that's, uh, you know, part of the framework we're going to look at um, in this course. You mentioned individualism and, and self-interest. Are there other philosophic ideas that the understanding of economics you're going to be advancing yes. or rooted in? Yeah, so I mean, when we talk about objectivism in particular, um, individualism and self-interest are, are you know, the two fundamental uh, ideas, but, but there's even a more fundamental idea. So if you think of, for anyone who's you know, read Ayn Rand, and, and you don't have to have read Ayn Rand, or be an objectivist to get value out of this course. I'm assuming you haven't read Ayn Rand and I'm assuming you know nothing about economics. So that's the beginning, but it will still be very valuable if you have studied economics and objectivism because it's the first time we're bringing it together, we're integrating the two. But if you think of Ayn Rand's books, individualism is really the theme you know, of the fountainhead, right? Uh, the idea of being, of. Uh, of the individual versus the collective, uh, you know, pursuing your individual self-interest. But if you think about Atlas Shrugged, there's a more fundamental theme of that book, which is the role of reason in man's life, okay? Now this relates to economics because reason is the source, is the, is the method we use to ascertain reality, and it's the method we use to create values. And I, this is one of the reasons where Ayn Rand points to the fundamentality of productiveness. We have to produce all the values that we need. They don't just fall from trees, okay? We produce those values using reason. And so there's a lot of economic implications of this, just one of them. And this, I think, is you don't find it in economics, okay? This, this, you don't find this idea in conventional economics a little bit. It's creeping into economics. It's creeping into economics because of Ayn, Ayn Rand, actually. But this is the role of the entrepreneur. And you'd be surprised. You could go through an intro economics class, and they won't even mention the word entrepreneur in the class. But if you think about it, we know that the entrepreneur is basically the fountainhead of all material progress, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, he's the man who invented Amazon that brings all these goods to us that we love and enjoy. Henry Ford invented the assembly line or, or applied the assembly line to the production of cars. And that brought the price of cars down so much that the masses of people could afford that. Our lives depend upon the achievements of the entrepreneurs. And what, mo what animates all of that is reason. So one of the implications you get into philosophical idea is that we must be free to use our reason. And then we get the principle of individual rights. We must be free to use our reason. And that means in an economic sense, we must be free to produce, which means that the rights of producers, which is all of us, we all produce in our own capacity, the rights of producers must be respected, which means our property rights must be respected. So I'm kind of beginning to teach the course here, but this is... Um, you know, the role of reason is very, very fundamental. Now, I just want to say one more thing about this, uh, if I may. Ayn Rand herself discovered an important principle of economics here, and she is not an economist. You know, by her own admission, she would say that. I think, you know, she understood it, but she's not an, an economist. She's a, a philosopher, so she's dealing with issues at a more fundamental level that we're going to try, you know, we're going to uh, try to bring into this course. But the principle of economics that she came up with and uh, uh, is something that, and I, I think she coined the term, she calls it the pyramid of ability. And it's an economic principle. It's really the same principle as Adam Smith's division of labor, okay? 
but it's applied in a more profound level. So Adam Smith's division of labor says we should each specialize in what we do best and then trade for the other goods we want, right? I might be a really good cob, I might be a really good shoemaker, cobbler, um, but a lousy baker of bread, I better, I'll work hard at making my shoes and trade for the bread that I want. Well, the principle of the pyramid of ability is, is the division of labor there is that there are the great creators who, who invent new products, who create the businesses that mass produce those products, right? And if they're free to perform their role, they will completely enhance our lives and our roles if we're, say, just working at the level of being a worker because we can trade for their goods. And we know this. See, it just needs to be identified, which is what I'm going to do in this course. We know this because it's around us in our world because it's, we still live in a very capitalistic world. It's a mixed economy, but it's capitalistic. So the example, I think the best example is Amazon. I mean, you know, or, or even, you know, you can even say not just Amazon or the iPhone. I mean, these things have transformed our lives right in front of our eyes because to the extent their creators are free to produce, which means then a further implication is to the extent they can get rich. We shouldn't be afraid of their riches. We should celebrate and applaud their riches. I wrote an article not that long ago, actually for the American Institute for Economic Research, um, talking about the fact that instead of lauding these great creators, people are placing guillotines in front of their homes, which someone did uh, placed yeah. a guillotine in front of the home of Jeff Bezos. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The thing obscene. that cuts your head off that was used in the French Revolution. Yeah. That is wrong. And that's a philosophical issue. Well, I'm so glad you're going to be uh, bringing in the pyramid of ability and talking about that. Um, by the way, there's an interesting link to the pyramid of, of ability and Adam Smith's famous statement that it's not from the benevolence of these producers that, that, that they bring you the bread or whatever. It's from, it's from their self-interest. In a sense, that's true. And in another sense, it's wrong because it is from their benevolence, yeah. right? Self-interested action is benevolent action, right? You know, when we, Jeff Bezos isn't sitting there going, well, I'm, I'm not, I don't care about the world. I'm just, you know, collecting the money over here. Jeff Bezos and these other producers, almost all of the major producers, are really life-loving, benevolent people. And so I, I, I wish there were a way to sort of recast. Now, we can't do it uh, and put it in Adam Smith's mouth. He said what he said. But, you know, the fact is it's from both the benevolence and the self-interest of these producers that we get the goods that they deliver to us. And you take somebody like me and, you know, I have a few abilities in this world, but I can't, I have no idea how, a, how an iPhone works, <laughs> much less how to manage a company the, the size of Amazon, right. And make all that happen. Right. It's insane how much thought and, and knowledge and effort goes into the production of these values. You know, uh, Larry Reed's, famous essay, I Pencil, which, which yeah. details how hard it, how much goes into making a, a freaking number two pencil, which is just a piece of wood with some paint on it and a piece of lead running through it and a little uh, rivet at the end of metal and a, and a rubber eraser, eraser at the tip. That's the whole thing. And he, he points out how much goes into this and how it is that no one person in the world can even make one of these things. Yeah. Right? Now you take essay. that you take that item and then go to the complexity of an iPhone or an Amazon or, uh, or the things that uh, Elon Musk is doing today or any of these, these, these uh, major producers or any, any f you know, phenomenally great artist, you know, a J.K. Rowling uh, or a, a Brian Larson, you know, these people who, who just do amazing work in some specialized field so that you can put this beautiful painting up in your home that you could never produce, but That's you can great. buy it for a reasonably low price given what it is, right? Or you can go buy a book by J.K. Rowling for $15 and be delighted for, for a month in, in the evenings of reading it, right? And so I, I love that you're bringing that in and I, I, I hope that, that part and parcel of bringing that in is just really elaborating the extent to which this whole business of production and trade really is win-win. And it's not only win-win at the, at, the, at the material level, it's win-win at the spiritual level all the way through, you know? And I agree completely. In fact, I, when I was writing down uh, Adam Smith quote, I had the exact same thought running through my mind. 
And, you know, this is where philosophy matters because, you know, Adam Smith, I give him a lot of credit. I mean, I really love the man oh, yeah. and he, he really is the father of the science. He's the first one to integrate it and tie it together. Um, but, you know, he was working with a faulty conception of self-interest and it's really ultimately, you know, uh, I think the roots of it lie in, uh, in Christianity and in, in the altruist ethics of Christianity. Um, but the idea is that there, human beings are given a false alternative. You, you know, either you just give up everything for your fellow man, you know, service to your fellow man, but where you're suffering as a result, you know, just giving away all your wealth is one side of the coin. And, and people who do that, like Mother Teresa, are held up as, as a noble ideal. And then the flip side of it is Scrooge. You know, so it's Christmas time right now. Let's think of Scrooge, you know, this miser who just is chiseling people and, you know, won't pay them, tries to just get the last dollar. It doesn't enjoy his life, right? He doesn't enjoy his life. That much is clear. That's a false alternative. And Ayn Rand broke through this false alternative. And she said, uh, self-interest is benevolent. It is benevolent. Uh, being, you know, if I care about myself, that means I care about my friends. That means I care about my family. That means, so let's get it back strictly to economics. That means I care about my customers. I care about them. You know, you can even extend this further. And, it, and I don't think this is a crazy thing to say. If I'm an entrepreneur, I love my customers. I love my customers on a certain level because they are they are the way that I gain all the great values in my life. I care about their welfare. I want the food product I make to be safe and tasty and enjoyable for them. I want that car like Henry Ford. Do you know in the early days when he made those cars, the roads were awful. And, you know, he had to make them with these super duper springs. You see them in these old black and white videos. He wanted farmers to be able to drive these cars out in the fields. And then they became tractors you know, he cared about his customers, yeah. you know, so it, it's like, but, but his goal was to benefit himself. So it's not mutually exclusive. And that's, it's interesting because Adam Smith as great as his statement was, you know, he's saying it's not from the benevolence of the baker because he's, he's still working with his false alternative. It's still a beautiful statement. He almost gets there, but he's still working with that false alternative. So I agree. Now, one other thing I would just say, another thing you mentioned, Craig, trade. So, that's the biggest principle of economics. And I, I, when I teach economics at the university, uh, in my university classes, I just say, I, I drill this home to students. All trade is mutually beneficial. You know, at least that's the intention, right? And you, can, you can regret a purchase, right? So leaving out instances like that. And when we say trade, we're not talking about fraud. That's not trade. I'm not talking about someone points a gun at someone. That's not trade. But where you say, you voluntarily say, I want this other thing and I'm going to pay for it by giving up something that I have for this other thing. It's always mutually beneficial. All trade is. And we're going to talk about that in this class. So, you know, to tie it with objectivism, Ayn Rand says, talks about the fact that in a capitalist society, there's a harmony of interests among people. Trade shows how this works. Now, there's a specific way that this harmony works, and this is a purely economic idea, and this is through the price mechanism, through market prices. Market prices constantly change to reflect the actual preferences of people who are doing the buying and selling. And if those preferences change, the prices change in a way that, for example, let's say more people, you know, want something, right? Like when they had this, um, this diet a while back, the, um, what's that not, you don't eat carbohydrates. What's that diet? Um, uh, paleo, you know, paleo diet, like a paleo, di paleo diet. In the first days of the paleo diet, the price of eggs went up. Why? And the price of bread went down. In fact, some bakery shut down because people wanted more meats and eggs and things like that. And they didn't want carbohydrates. So the, the demand, and we'll look at this demand curves, you know, demand curve shifts to the right, the demand increased. So the price went up and that motivated new sellers of these products to come in and make more of the stuff to satisfy the change in people's needs. That's capitalism. 
and that's you know that's mutual self interest and mutual benefit. The uh, the benevolence aspect of this, I just wanted to comment that th- this time of year we see this particularly vividly. Uh, I saw a beautiful Christmas commercial this morning, and um, if anyone lo- wants to look it up, it's by a company Doc Morris, and the, it's a ad called "Take Care of Yourself." And you know, obviously, Doc Morris, whoever this company is, whatever it is they're selling, um, they want you to know about them and, and to go find out what it is and be one of their customers. But the market has given them the impetus to create beauty, and you know, the market gives people like J.K. Rowling and and Brian Larson and uh, you know, all sorts of, of people to create spiritual values that we can all enjoy. Let me give you one, sorry, just not to interrupt, but there's a famous composer that some of the listeners will be familiar with is Rachmaninoff. And the story is that when he uh, emigrated from Russia to the United States, um, his motivation for composing, and I think it was the second piano concerto, I'm not sure, or the third piano concerto, was so he could get the money to buy a, a, like a Cadillac, a new car. <laughs> And it's one of it's a beautiful piece of music for anyone who has you know either of those concertos are beautiful pieces of music. But people are motivated to be creative and to create beautiful things by self interest. Yes, you've indicated uh, sort of who this class is for, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more specifically who you envision taking this. Well, so I think um, you know I think a lot of people can take this. Uh, um, someone who just uh, at different levels. So, I, I, um, if you know, if one group, it would be just someone who has had an economics class at the university level. Um, you know, maybe the uh, student who's majored in economics. Um, there are real gaps. You know, if I'm speaking to you, there are real gaps in your knowledge, like the idea of the pyramid of the ability, um, pyramid of ability, for example, and and. You know, there are just certain gaps in how economics is approached. Uh, You you know, economics in a classroom today is taught from a utilitarian perspective, like the group. You know, we're talking about the group and and that economics is sort of the purpose of economics. And, you know, is to figure out how to take money from one group, part of the group and give it to the other to somehow maximize the benefit to the group. Well, if you have an individualist perspective, you'd reject that whole approach at its root. So I think that's one group that would benefit. Um, another group would be, you know, maybe the same group, but anyone who wants to um, speak up or write uh, in opposition to, you know, the many ways that government, um, uh, you know, wants to thwart our prosperity uh, by intervening in the markets, by, you know, violating market principles. And, and, and so that, that's another group. You're going to gain tools to do that really complicated. We're going to you know, hopefully get into some pretty complicated issues. This is meant to be an introductory course, but we're going to talk about banking, for example. That's a hard thing to understand, but it's important because we hear it, we're dealing with this all the time. You know, the central bank, the federal reserve, you know, business cycles, things like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's another group. Uh, there are a couple others I was thinking of. Another group would be just, you know, someone who just wants to know more about economics. Maybe they've never taken a course in their lives. And you're going to learn some really good economics here. I, I think this will be a better economics course than almost anything you can find out there. Um, so, so, if somebody has, so, so if someone has zero uh, knowledge of economics, they're going to be fine coming into this course. You're going to, it's, it's going to be, uh, at, at a level they can understand yet even if you have some knowledge of economics it's still gonna it's still gonna be enjoyable and uh, and useful for you that's exactly correct okay. it's gonna be or, i'm gonna assume you've had no uh training in economics at all okay um but i but i think so the course come in here if you if you don't know anything about economics but i think I, I think it will be a benefit to someone who's had any level of economics just because the integrations, the bringing yeah. the philosophy and objectivism into it. Yeah, that, that's the thing that seems to me to be what's so neat about this. And for people who haven't studied economics yet, to study it for the first time with that integration will be a real, a real treat because uh, it really ought to be taught that way generally. Um, yes. You know, they, they, so many economists have tried to make e- economics a value-free science. They even talk about it as a value-free science. 
And that's kind of absurd because you're talking about people producing things and trading them and this is value free somehow. What are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but the reason I think they've kept away from it is because so many economists were afraid to deal with the moral elements because they didn't have a morality that integrated with economics. They had only moralities that, that were at war with economics. So you know, go, going back to, uh, to Adam Smith, you know, and you, you don't want to anachronistically go back and, and criticize these guys. Adam Smith didn't know about morality, what we know today, thanks to Ayn Rand. So you can't yeah. be like, shame on you, Adam Smith, for not developing, you know, not, not understanding egoism as well as developing, you know, uh, the, the science of economics, right? I mean, that's just unfair. You have to grant people their context, right? Um, but, but today, with the knowledge that we have from Rand, her philosophic ideas and, and, and her idea about the, the pyramid of ability, which, as you point out, is really an economic point as well, um, there's this ability now to learn economics in a much richer, much more grounded way. And for anyone who, who has the opportunity to do that with you, I know this is going to be a really, really fun, interesting course. I agree completely, Craig. And you know, this thing about the way it's taught today is, you know, the people try to attempt to teach it as a value-free science, which is absurd. I mean, I, here's how I think about economists. So I've always thought of it, you, it's all about values. I think of an economist like a doctor, okay? Now, a doctor um, is concerned about their goal is the health of their patient, right? But to, to achieve that, they are rigorously objective and totally devoted to evidence in that process. Now, one of the concerns that economists will have, one is that what you said, they just, you know, if they really think about morality, then they're dealing with altruism and it's at war with their economic ideas. But the other thing is they're concerned also about objectivity. And one of their mistakes, this is a philosophical mistake, is that if you have um, a value interest, that you can't be objective. Well, are doctors not objective? So what, how do I think of we're like doctors? I'm concerned about the economic health of society. I wanna live in a prosperous society and one where I can prosper and everyone around me can prosper. I'm a doctor, okay? Yeah. To, so that's, I'm very value motivated. It's a human motivation. Like the, the welfare of human beings is what matters, but, I'm, but to achieve that, I have to be rigorously objective. So I, this idea of value, being value-free, it's interesting, one of the big advocates of this was Milton Friedman. And it's surprising because actually, you know, then he did a whole bunch of, apart from his academic work, he did a lot of uh, popular level uh, uh, books and, and video uh, presentations, like his Free to Choose series, which appear, appeared on public television and this book by the same name. It's loaded with values. So it's funny, but he yet, he was a, big, big advocate of the idea that economics should be value-free. One last thought on that. The left, so the people who hate capitalism, who hate freedom, people who even advocate communism or socialism, they've never thought of economics as a value-free science. And I know because I, I monitor their writings. Uh, they they uh, fully see uh, capital, I mean, see economics as something to achieve value goals and their value goal is uh you know it, it, well it's complicated right ostensibly it's to help the poor but it's it, it's i think it also it goes uh, it, it, a good part of it is about bringing down the successful but you know but anyways they know that it's about values and they're, it's all over their supposedly their supposed economic writings why can't people and i don't think my this is you know i'm not on the right we're on the pro-capitalist side, whatever you want to call that left or right. I call that the right. Okay, very good. Fine. There's I'll, no point in having a political spectrum that doesn't have one end that's correct. That's fine. Then I'll doesn't say right. Make any sense. I will use right and keep that for that reason. So those on the right, they're going to dispense with values. The people on the left are using values. And, and here's the thing. This is the ultimate reason for taking this course. That's why the left is successful. They're successful because they are bringing values into it, because they see this as a moral battle and they're going to win. Then people on the right, they timidly talk about, well, you know, 
capitalism is efficient, it results in the greatest good for the greatest number, and they say, no way, communism results in the greatest good for the greatest number. I don't care about your arguments. Yeah, as soon as the greatest good for the greatest number is the goal, unfortunately for the, uh, the alleged defenders of freedom who embrace that utilitarian view, they've already lost the game. And this, by the way, is true of Hazlitt himself, right? Hazlitt was a utilitarian, explicitly so, right? He wrote a book on morality before he wrote his book on, uh, on economics. And in that book, he is he clearly sides with utilitarianism. Um, and this, again, I'm not going to shake a finger at Hazlitt for this either. He wrote that book when he was quite young, and he also, um, he, he didn't, he knew Rand, so he had less of an excuse than Adam Smith in, in, in this case for not grasping these points. But Rand's philosophy is rich in really understanding what egoism is and, and, and why it doesn't mean stabbing people in the back to get you what you want and all of that. It's not, it's, it's not a simple thing. Um, so again, this speaks to the importance of this integration that, that you're making, because if you don't identify explicitly egoism as the foundation for economics, the default in economics is to utilitarianism, yes. especially because economics deals in aggregates. So it's yes. all about, you know, what's going on in, in, in the economy, meaning in the, 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 the social environment where people are producing and trading. Ayn Rand, of course, wants always to talk about what's going on in the life of an individual. What are individuals free or not free to do? And what is, what is the, what's the implication of this or the effect of this on their lives? And this is the integration, this individualism and individual rights, all based in egoism, tied in with these absolutely true principles of economics but now grounded in a correct morality rather than in a morality that capitulates the entire thing to the communist right from the beginning. Right. So I completely agree. So I hope, I hope I, you know, th I mean, that's, that's what people should get out of this course yeah. is that putting economics on the correct philosophical foundation of egoism and reason um, and individualism. Cool. Well, Looking look, I'm super, it. go ahead, John. I was, I was going to say, I'm really looking forward to the course. Um, people can check out more and sign up for it at, at uh, objectivestandard.org. It's starting January 5th and going through February 23rd. And I believe that's, uh, that's on uh, Tuesday evenings from 5.30 Pacific uh, starting time to uh, 8 Pacific, right? Yeah, that is correct. And let me, let me uh, add one last thing here. I was so excited at the start of this interview, because I'm just so excited about this course, that I failed to tell you who Dr. Ray Niles is in terms of, in terms of what he does. And so let me just point out, uh, Dr. Niles has a PhD in economics from George Mason University. Uh, he actually was taught by the recently late and very great uh, Dr. Wal Walter Williams, um, and was uh, was in his courses, and I assume had some uh, personal interaction with Dr. Williams as well. Uh, Ray has taught economics at the university level at several universities. He's worked for many years on Wall Street as a senior equity research analyst. Uh, he's currently a senior fellow at, and, and a columnist at the American Institute for Economic Research. As well, he's a contributing editor to the Objective Standard and, of course, an instructor at Objective Standard Institute. So busy man. And uh, um, if, you're, if you have any interest in economics or in uh, philosophy or in defending liberty in today's uh, crazy anti-liberty environment, this course will enrich your, your ability to do that uh, by orders of magnitude, I think. So uh, enroll soon. Uh, the course is limited in space and we have families approaching us now uh, for this course and for Eric Daniels' course, Dr. Daniels is teaching a course on the history and philosophy of liberty in America. We have families approaching us wanting family deals, packages to get their, their, the, the parents and their kids into the course. So uh, sign up soon. And um, thanks again for joining us, Ray. My pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to teaching it. And I hope to see you people out there in the course. Thank you. Great. Take care.